Well, hi, I'm Guy. Hi, everyone. I'm Sandy. And uh, we're here to learn about uh, storing tomatoes from uh, suckers. So uh, our title is uh, Economic Implications of Starting Late Season Tomatoes from Seeds versus Suckers. And this all came about kind of through a SARE grant. We got in 2016, it was a two-year SARE grant. And uh, we wanted to see about, uh, you know, time and money-wise and starting tomatoes late season from seed versus from suckers. And if you don't know what suckers are, you will find out here in just a little bit, but all tomatoes have suckers on them. Um, I'll start off maybe a little bit here, uh, tell you a little bit about our farm, and then we'll kind of get into the sucker business on that. So this is our family. Uh, my name is Sandy, she took the picture. Yep, I got but uh, lately by the fence is our daughter, uh, Nellie, and she farms full time with that girl's flowers uh, right here at the farm, and her husband Joel, and then uh, center is our son Connor Dashmore. He's a uh, equal partner in the produce here at the farm, and he also farms organic uh, corn, beans, and uh, small grains and hay with another partner. Then next to him is our other daughter Maggie, and she farms full time in Eastern Kentucky and Clay County, raising organic produce, and along with her husband Will. That raises lots of proteins down there, you know, beef, pork, uh, chicken, uh, sheep. Uh, this was this year's crew. Uh, we generally raise about six to eight acres of uh, produce, along with about two acres of cut flowers. Uh, we sell at uh, one farmer's market. We wholesale at some small groceries in Dayton and uh, Cincinnati. Uh, we have an honor system here at the farm. And... Um, do a CSA, a small CSA, a winter and a summer one. But that was uh, Kelly with the red flowers. She was with uh, produce this year. Then Emma uh, with the yellow flowers is her second year with Nellie. Nellie and our granddaughter, uh, Maribel, and Sandy and the rest of the crew here. Uh, like I said, we sell at a, a farmer's market. Uh, everybody's pretty familiar with that. Uh, and this picture is uh, Liz. And she was with us in uh, 2015. And actually, she's the one that kind of encouraged us to do this SARE grant. Uh, she was real intrigued with these suckers. And we've talked about SARE grants. And if you don't know about SARE grants, we'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, she started, uh, she wrote the uh, outline for the grant, actually. And then we've been doing cut flowers since, uh, oh, 20 some years. And Nellie took over that part of the farm about seven years ago. So SARE is a Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. It's kind of through the USDA, and they give out grants to farmers and ranchers, uh, colleges, uh, high schools, for educational purposes on sustainable ag. Uh, they're a really neat organization, and we were fortunate enough to get accepted. And actually, we've got a short video. It's about four minutes, and it's going to explain quite a bit. Uh, this came about, they do uh, spot checks every year, and this is how this uh, little video came about. We are Guy and Sandy Ashmore from That Guy's Family Farm. We are in southwest Ohio in between Cincinnati and Dayton. And our SARE project was uh, economic impact of late season tomatoes uh, crop with starting from suckers versus uh, seed. And we're getting our suckers from existing tomato plants and uh, seeing how much time savings that would be uh, in a busy time. Uh, we're also kind of limited on labor and equipment for greenhouse space. So uh, suckers could be just taken from the plant and started. And we're doing a uh, trial here with three different varieties. And we are a certified organic farm, so we are following all those practices as well. The varieties that we have in here are really field varieties and not varieties you might find in a tunnel situation. So we have some Arkansas travelers for... Uh, testing some heirlooms, uh, big beef, a very traditional red slicer, and then we have 4th of July, which would be an early producer, um, so, early tomato, yeah. And one thing about uh, for being certified organic, it's hard to find late season tomato starts that are certified organic. So that's one reason we're really excited about these suckers. We can take them right from our farm and uh, not have to worry, search somewhere for expensive late season tomatoes. And uh, we're open in the tunnels, you know, a lot of research has been done on disease resistance. So we're kind of hoping to see how suckers will do with uh, plants started from seed. Yeah, we're also, you know, curious about, you know, 
um, wisdom and knowledge from the past. So this whole idea came about from someone telling us at market that their father would always start his late season tomatoes from the sucker. So it just, you know, a light bulb moment. We decided we thought we could do that. We are also a farm that didn't um, produce too many transplants in a greenhouse. So we did a lot of direct seeding. We um, depend on another grower that would do some of our transplants. So this was one way we could, you know, get, get a transplant without having a greenhouse. Well, I think, you know, if you're a limited resource farmer with uh, smaller um, equipment, you really wouldn't need a, a greenhouse to start these transplants. You wouldn't have to uh, invest in the you know, potting soil and the likes. You can just take these suckers right off the plant. And right there, I think it's a big win situation that you don't have to worry in a July if your seedlings are going to die in a greenhouse because you forgot to water them, which came close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think it just really kind of helps uh, – be a full circle to keep everything on the farm. Your inputs are coming from the farm that you're working on, and you know, you're helping to build your soil to build your plants to, to continue that, that circle. Our one, and you snap it off. And you would just stick that right in the soil mix about there. We do. And then, first, you know, uh, two or three days they're going to look like they're dead. So it's kind of like spinach. And then within about two weeks, they'll be almost root bound in the container. Uh, Sarah, we went to Sarah because we've seen some research projects they've done in the past, and it seems like they're free thinkers too and willing to uh, support uh, new ideas, maybe even old ideas like the suckers from transplants. And uh, they've been uh, great to work with so far, and uh, I think they're really good at spreading the education across the country at different regions they have. And it's uh, really been a big help. And we always like looking at what everybody else is trying, and you don't know till you do it really on the farm if it's going to work or not in a real life situation and I think Sarah's good at helping us do that. One reason we wanted late uh, season tomatoes is we get, uh, we're in a bottom ground, our, our farm is mostly uh, bottom ground soils or all of it is. We get lots of late dews, uh, lots of moisture, so we get lots of early blight down here. So our tomatoes a lot of times don't last as long in the season as other farmers. So we kind of wanted to push that envelope a little bit and have some early tomatoes for our winter CSA which starts in October and November. And uh, that was kind of the, the reason for this. Sandy mentioned in the video that you know, a customer at uh, Farmer's Market mentioned it. And that customer was actually about 80. So his dad was raising these, you know, back, you know, knowledge that kind of gets lost. Um, here's our tomatoes in the field. We raise about, I don't know, 2,000 field tomatoes. And um, we try to do wide spacing so we get more airflow to try to avoid early blight. And uh, then we mulch so we don't get water splash, but we still really fight early blight, uh, it's a main problem. So this is about the size of the tomatoes are when we get the suckers off. Um, like Sandy said, we wanted to use varieties that are using field production, because that's what we have. You know, there's, uh, we're not, uh, you want to learn how to raise tomatoes really good in a, a greenhouse or high tunnels. So we're not the person to come to, you know, we don't do that that much, but uh, we do have, a, that's kind of why we wanted to, to try this out to see if we could use our field to varieties for this. And uh, the first year we did 4th of July Big Beef and Arkansas Traveler. The second year we went with uh, Green Zebra instead of Arkansas Traveler. Uh, green Zebras really did not like the tunnel for us. So here's the plant and there's the suckers. You know, they're, what they are are just side shoots that come off the plant. A lot of people trim those off anyway for trying to get better yield, better production. So there's one right there by my thumb. Actually, this one's got three suckers on it. Um, the one right here in Sandy's hand is about the size we kind of like to do them. They could be bigger, and you'll see in these other photos, they are bigger. So that's a sucker, you, you just, just snap them off. It's almost just too easy to, to believe how this works. Uh, these suckers are bigger, and we use a 72 cell tray. Um, we just, you know, just stick them in there. We don't use any uh, rooting compound or, or anything like that. We just stick them in uh, some great soil mix we get from Peach Mountain. Uh, 
then what happens, you, you put them in there, and then they look like cooked spinach in a, about a day or two. And what we do is we try to keep them out of the direct sun. Here we got them underneath the flatbed wagon where they get some daylight, you know, but they're out of direct sun. They get some indirect in the morning. And they'll look like this, you know, you'll think they're dead. We always do every year. And then after about a week, you know, they're standing up and you're just kind of remarkable. Uh, here's a one week old sucker. You can kind of see by the stem on the top of my hand how firm it is. And that's the roots already after uh, one week. There's after two weeks, and you know, it's not root bound, but it's just, uh, just it's always remarkable. A little fuzzy, but see there. And then there's like a six weeks on the left versus a two week suckers on the right. You can even see the suckers got better color. Um, and you know, that time of year, it's just really tough in the uh, end of June and July to have time to keep up for us in the greenhouse. Right, so that's the control group, which is just um, plants that we had started in the greenhouse, uh, which are the ones on the left, and then the suckers were on the right. So um, you know, there was always that fear that we weren't going to get them water. Um, it kind of just tells the same thing we've been saying. You know, we struggle to do it during our busiest months of the year, and it says you know farmers working to produce six or more acres of vegetables and we've got a small crew uh we try to be as efficient as we can and you know everybody's you want to keep your cost of production down and your suckers are, are, are free then here we are in the tunnel and your part of this sear grant if you've ever looked at the sear grants you know you do get money and ours was about fifty three hundred dollars for a two-year grant and actually i paid for this tunnel and their labor and uh you know potting soil um, seeds. Uh, we, you know, with that grant, we had to have a, a field day and do a public demonstration and just some things, you know, that you normally do farming. So it really wasn't anything out of the ordinary. Probably the biggest thing out of the ordinary is us using this tape measure because we're really not that uh, precise. And uh, you know, usually you go by the wet holes to how far apart you put your tomatoes. But, you know, we, uh, we, uh, Smart it up, I guess you might say, and uh, try to do this so we can keep track of all, all this for Sarah. And I was thinking that um, for the labor hours, it could only be the farmer. So you couldn't hire things when you're uh, hire someone out or use their hours for a Sarah grant. So it has to be you doing the labor and tracking it. And then we did, uh, you know, we had three beds in here. We always call them beds, but uh, so we had six rows. And they were side by side. Uh, Sandy's planting big beef right here. And the suckers are what she's planting right now. And then on the right that's laying out to get planted are the ones from seed. Um, we did 80 suckers and 80 seeded transplants. And then we, you know, we string and clip like our, to get them up. And this just kind of shows you that, you know, suckers have suckers. Right below that clip is a sucker coming out. So, you know, if you had a heated greenhouse of lights, I guess you could just keep taking suckers off and for, for forever. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. And this is probably, this is 4th of July. They're a smaller tomato. If you never raised them, they're, they're a great tomato. Maybe about an inch and a half diameter, two inches. And these are probably about, uh, you know, six weeks, eight weeks. That time of year, you know, you got full sunlight. Things really just take off. And this is probably, you know, middle of September. And this picture here is kind of demonstrating, uh, uh, you can see there's two rows there and the suckers are on the left and the ones from seed are on the right. You know, they look identical. And, you know, we really can tell any difference in diseases or, or uh, growth habits. Um, so here's kind of some figures. So in 2016, we started uh, the seeds on May 18th, and then we uh, snapped the suckers off on June 16th. Both were planted on July 11th, and we picked till the uh, killing frost, which was November 11th inside that tunnel. Uh, harvest began on August 8th. And in 2017, you know, we were behind again. I mean, we was a week later getting our seeds started, and a week later kind of uh, getting the suckers. Uh, both were planted on July 17th, which is a week later than the year before. 
And then the harvest began almost two weeks later that year. And uh, the killing frost came in October 21st. And what was kind of interesting on this, uh, the tomatoes in 2017 in that tunnel actually out yielded the ones in 2016, even though we harvested a couple weeks uh, shorter. And we found out, you know, it works. And uh, we'll say this uh, grant started in 2016. I think the first suckers we planted, like about a handful out in the field was 2013. And then we kind of increased it just a little bit, trying to uh, play around with it. It's really time saving. It's easy, you know, an economical way to produce late season tomato transplants. Uh, as a bonus, we found that uh, suckers increased the yields and they ripened up to about a week sooner. So we were harvesting the uh, sucker tomatoes about a week sooner than we were the ones from seed, even though the seed plants were older. And if you actually went to um, the SARE website, you can look this up and it has like our daily logs. It has the amounts of tomatoes that were harvested each day or every other day. And all of that's on there. I couldn't actually get it to fit into this presentation. So it was there on the SARE website. Even more information. And we just uh, counted what tomatoes were uh, marketable. You know, they had uh, hormone damage or something like that. We did not weigh them. And there you go, you know, hornworms like all tomatoes, if they're inside or outside. Um, like I said, we saw no difference on what they preferred. Oh, that was a little fuzzy there, but there we go. So, so the sucker tomatoes, you know, transplants used almost 20 less hours of labor, 19 and a half to produce, and five less weeks of uh, worrying about them, you know, watering them and uh, making sure they're not cooked. And uh, for a cereal, we had to put a dollar amount on stuff. So 19 and a half hours equal about $390 in labor. The sucker tomatoes yielded 21% more fruit, which it was uh, fabulous. And that equaled like $368 more also in those two seasons. Uh, we were surprised at the increase in yields. I didn't really think uh, it would be that much difference. Uh, we were able to harvest five to seven weeks longer than the field tomatoes because the road light you know, took them out about you know, second week of September, third week. And in the tunnels, we really saw no difference in disease. I was kind of worried since uh, we take the suckers off, we usually have early blight already kind of starting on our plants. So I was, or we were, thinking, oh, we take these suckers in the tunnel, they're going to just continue with that early blight. But there was no di difference in diseases in there. And we think everybody should try it. It's just uh, pretty fun to see. You only do one in your flower bed. Uh, so here we go. The valuation of transplants produced from suckers did increase profitability, reduced our time and resources needed, and created a late season crop that had environmental, economic, and social benefits for the farm, farmers, and customers. Uh, this forward thinking using traditional wisdom of the past can lead to greater financial stability for farmers. And we all need to be more financially sustainable. And that might be good. Okay, I guess. Sorry, these are messed up. So recommendations was uh, it's a simple process of producing a second. This one kind of says that you might be able to do a second uh, production just out in the field without putting them in tunnels, depending on where you're at. So, you know, if you wanted to, uh, I think everybody's yields start to decline on tomatoes, no matter if you got early blight or not coming, you know, into September. So there's the potential to keep the farmer ahead of disease. I might set it on the first crop. Uh, collection of suckers can begin as soon as they're formed. Then two weeks later, transplant to grow a second crop. And then you keep planting, you know, every two to three weeks if you wanted. Uh, we haven't done that, but I think it's very possible. Another thing I really think is that you could take the suckers and actually not even put them in the 72 cell trays. I think you could just plant them, take them and just put them right in the ground. You'd have to put some shade cloth over them because they wilt so bad. But I really think you almost could take away almost all that labor. Uh, maybe we'll try that this year. I keep saying we're going to, and then uh, things, you know, gets around around the spokes here. But uh, I, just, I really don't see any reason why you would have to put them in that cell tray except to keep them shaded. And I think shade cloth can work with that with hoops, I believe. Or a rainy week, maybe. Or a rainy week <laughs> coming up, right? It's going to be overcast. Uh, and I don't know if that's the last slide. 
Yeah. Yeah. That would be for questions, but. Yeah. So I guess uh, I kind of went through that kind of quick, but for questions about anything? Uh, so are all the tomatoes you grow uh, indeterminate? Yes. Yeah, we raise one variety for disease, but probably all of you know thirty varieties you raise, twenty nine are are indeterminate. Uh, and your indeterminate's put on lots of suckers, right? <laughs> so you have an unlimited supply on that. Uh, we didn't try any determinants, but our, that would that'd be something else to, to work on. I said it's almost just uh, too simple of a process. Uh, when the gentleman told us about it, you know, I thought maybe he had forgotten something from his youth that he had to have more steps to it. But it really is just as simple as breaking a sucker off and, and putting it in the soil. Now, if anybody raises tomatoes, you know, they lay on the ground, they start to root anyway. So, you know, it's not as surprising when you start to think about the whole plant. Well, I have a question. Um, are there any varieties that you don't think, I mean, I can't wait to do this this year. Are there any varieties that you think just wouldn't work? You know, we had green zebra in there. Yeah. And, uh, they were just kind of went crazy. They uh, multi-branched really bad and they, the yield was really just not there. But oh, like okay. Big beef and uh, uh, Fourth of July and Arkansas travelers just did just fantastic. So I don't think, I know, Cherries just take off. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Have a research thing, but we've done cherries in the past, and they just uh, love it. We did like three different varieties of cherries, and they really, really. Yeah. Enjoy. Yeah. That, well, we'll get into Sarah. If you have any ideas for Sarah, and I tell you, I had to put in a plug for Sarah and Ofa. Uh, I said in them two workshops that Ofa gave over the years on writing Sarah grants, and uh, it was very helpful. On that, uh, the main one they said was make sure you can read your grant. <laughs> you do it by hand, make sure it's re readable, or it probably won't go through it. And uh, they couldn't have been more easy to work with. Uh, so, really, if you got any type of grant, you know, I think, you know, if we wanted to do a new grant with your cherries versus determinants, uh, you know, that would be something to just fall into it. So, sometimes people get a SARE grant and then you realize you need more information and they will help you with that if you really got a viable uh, project. Um, all the time you can in. I think I will try it. Yeah, I'm excited to try it as well. Especially just uh, snapping them off and sticking them in the ground. Right. Yeah. I mean, really, what do you got to lose? <laughs> right. And, you know, most people take their suckers off anyway to up to the first bloom or more. So you got a use for them. Yeah. Guy, do your uh, customers rec recognize your real organic project label yet? No, you know, we just got uh, that about in August, I believe. And we've had it up at market trying to get some encouragement. We really, we really haven't pushed it too much either, but uh, hopefully more and more will and more, more of us will uh, join with it, you know. I think they've got a good, good program, and I think they're uh, really passionate about it. So, yeah, I've been encouraged by that certified organic, and they've been great to work with, also. Amber, do you want to put that link for the evaluation into the chat now? I can do that for sure. Give people a chance to do that because it looks like some people are already kind of drifting away. Dropping out. We'll absolutely do that. There's our email. Uh, feel free to contact us. Have any questions about suckers or anything else we're doing? Uh, we're glad to share. Guy, I would love to come out and see your farm. How do you feel about visitors? Oh, we always like to have visitors, you know. We, always try to have an open farm policy, you know, if I come down to show you, sometimes people stop by, we don't have time, but they're welcome to go anywhere they want. But if we know you're coming, we'd be love to have you. Great. 
and hopefully maybe in time tomatoes are ready to sucker, we won't be wearing masks and <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Acting like we're uh, scared to, to see each other, you know. Thank you, Guy. Thank you all. Hey, Guy, on the um, can you hear me? This is Martin. Yes, hey, Martin. Yeah. So part of the SARE grant was was the hoop house also, and to see if you right. can extend extend the season on the tomatoes. It sure was. Uh, they helped pay for that the high tunnel, okay. and uh, it, that one there. We've got a few high tunnels. That one's uh, just a forty eight footer. Usually, I think on research they kind of go with the that size. Seemed to be more common than trying to get a hundred footer because you don't really need a hundred foot maybe for a research. Uh, and you need more than, you know, a 20 foot or so. It's kind of seems like that 50 foot's kind of a, a good recommendation for you when you do that. Uh, we, we actually put that one up ourselves. So, you know, that kind of counted as, as some of the labor for, for the grant. Yeah, if you did go look up, there's a, quite a bit of information on our grant. I mean, if you we went to 2016 uh, farmer rancher grants and looked at Ohio, you would find us in that. You could see all the, uh, the grant proposal we wrote up and then our, you know, our research at the end, how we wrote it up and what field days we had and things like that. But it was uh, really other than writing a grant and uh, it wasn't much more than what we're doing already, you know. Plus, if you're certified organic, you're doing daily logs, and you know, you're keeping lots of paperwork anyway. So, it really, uh, wasn't much much additional labor on our part. Right. I guess if you were going to put them directly out in the field, you're just risking the length of the season, right? Using suckers. Right. Right. Frost, Frost would be your you know, eliminating factor on that. I yeah. Think if, depending on how big an area you've got to plant, you know, I mean, uh, we're kind of doing field production. But I think if we did it in uh, on our farm, we would try to separate those uh, as much as we could, just because we'd already have early blight starting, and that way we wouldn't want to start right next to them. You know, we would try to move them away, the, like I said, probably as much as you could, so you wouldn't have that carryover. I'm trying to help limit that. So did, what what fertilizer do you use when you did the suckers we in your hoop house? Uh, I believe it's like a five, four, five or so. Uh, generally in a tunnel that size, we only put down like about 50 pounds. Then we, you know, we added compost with that also. Uh, it seems like it was kind of weird this year. Uh, actually, we only found two hornworms. I don't know what happened, but in, in the tunnels in the past, we've had uh, worm problems in there. We had had to use some BT in there, and I've always been kind of surprised how like army worms and uh, the hornworms get in those tunnels. Uh, you know, sometimes I think they're worse than they are in the field, maybe just because you're in there with them so close and they're you know, above your head, but uh, this year was, um, I don't know, hopefully it's the same next year, but uh, we were just kind of amazed to the no worm problems. I think did, the permits would be. A did good you put any fertilizer mid mid season? Uh, no, we didn't. We usually amend just once. Uh, we did no foliar sp yeah. spraying on them for uh, like a fish or a uh, black bike either. Okay. You know, kind of revisiting this project, I think determinants, if you had determinants and you did those, it'd be very interesting because you might get a bigger flush of uh, fruit uh, towards the end before frost. Then the you know, indeterminates kind of spread out the, the yield. So you might, you know, because you're kind of bumping up against that frost, even though they're in tunnels, you know, when we get down to, you know, 26 or something, we're, we're pretty well done with tomatoes or 28 at night. And like I said, we're in, a, in bottom ground. So we get frost a lot earlier in the fall, later in the spring. Uh, but, you know, determinants just kind of thinking off my head that might be a way to get a, a bigger push of a yield in a shorter span than uh, the indeterminates. Right. 